Our New Testament lesson is from Acts 1, or Acts 2, 1 through 21. This is a particularly long passage, but I wanted you to hear it because it is the classic passage of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. I am one of those people who never knew when to stop going to school. And it seemed like the further I went, the more languages I had to somehow get under my belt. I took Spanish in college, and then I had to learn a little Hebrew and Greek in seminary, and then in graduate school, German and French. I learned just enough grammar to get by. Of course, like anything else, once I got my card stamped, I never had to bother with it again. <laughs> I have no facility for speaking languages, but my wife does. She speaks fluent French and uh, some German and knows some Hebrew and Greek. And I think it's a gift when you have, you have a facility for language. And I learned an important lesson about language uh, when we lived in Chicago, which is a city of immigrants. That is its very nature. And there are people from all over the world there. And I came to believe that language barriers were much more difficult than cultural barriers. I mean, uh, pity the poor uh, grade school teacher who would have to write a message to send home in like 15 or 20 languages sometimes. The children would learn English, but sometimes uh, the parents and especially grandparents would live in Chicago for many years and never learn to speak English. And then we were in Memphis. Uh, Amy was in her first job. and uh, Now Memphis is 
at the corner, you know, southwest corner, south, yeah, southwest corner of Tennessee, and it borders on Arkansas and on uh, Mississippi. And the secretary of her church was from Mississippi, and Amy said she she couldn't figure out how to understand her for a year. Uh, Amy, having lived all her life in the Northeast, and um, she said it sounded like that secretary had a mouthful of marbles when she spoke. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I am forever intrigued that the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the ability to speak different languages. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. Disciples now called apostles, which simply means, it's a word meaning they're sent on a mission by God. In that sense, we're all apostles. But they are there gathered as they've been instructed to do by the Lord before he, His ascension into heaven. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And, it, and what is that main empowerment of the Holy Spirit for them? Why, it allows them to communicate to all different kinds of people, even people who speak different languages. You know that it was very powerful because even the Apostle Peter, who had been a pretty defensive and sometimes cowardly person, became a confident spokesperson for the whole group and spoke to the crowd. Paul, uh, Peter was transformed by the power of the Spirit, able now to communicate God's Word to everyone. And in today's world, the church needs for the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to speak in different languages so that we can accomplish that same mission given to them to speak God's word, to tell about God's love and mighty acts and the resurrection. And as Jesus told his followers to make disciples to the ends of the earth. And... Um, We have a language barrier today. It's actually worse than the one in Chicago. And that is a language barrier between the church and contemporary culture. We don't speak the same languages. And it is not up to contemporary culture to learn our language. It is on us to learn contemporary languages so that we can speak to contemporary people. I was reminded of a lesson that the mega churches have taught everyone. It's been several decades now since these huge churches got started. They did two things. They started learning the language of contemporary people. They looked at worship and they saw that worship was filled with older cultural clutter. And they said, well, what if we get rid of some of that old clutter that nobody likes anymore and we keep the essence of the Christian message? We just sort of... Uh, sort of couch it in a little bit contemporary language. And they did, and people just started coming from all over. It was amazing. The other thing they did, and when people were uh, learning about the Christian message in contemporary ways, um, the other thing they did was they required people to learn a, a different kind of language by being in small groups, they required, oftentimes required, if you're going to be a church member, you're going to be in a small group. So you're going to learn the language of Scripture 
and you're going to learn how to talk about your life in relation to God and the, and the lessons that Scripture teaches us. And you're going to learn how other people talk about their spiritual life. And you're going to learn from them. And they're going to learn from you. And you all will care for each other. And then when you come to that huge giant worship service on Sunday... Well, you're going to have a whole group of people that you know and care about. So, the church has been about learning new languages and teaching new languages for many, many years. And um, so, we have, I was thinking about here at IPC, we have three languages that we're trying to learn. And um, one of them is spiritual language. And we have characterized that if you look at your bulletin, remember the tree, the roots of the tree, strengthening our rootedness in Christ's love. And we did, we focused on that by starting small groups for spiritual growth. There just is no um, alternative to actual study and actual conversation with one another. And so we learn the language of spirituality in the church and we try to teach it in ways that enable us to communicate with one another and with the stranger. Another kind of language that we have tried to start learning is that of... of um, symbolized by the trunk of the tree, which we called growing strong in faith. And uh, I've been thinking about that, and I'm wondering if we ought to say uh, growing bold in faith, because we have interpreted that in terms of our church following Jesus by going out in community and being the church in the larger community in various ways. And we have done some of that. Uh, uh, you know, we've got our third um, July 4th parade in which we have the opportunity to be part of the parade again. I remember that first time. We got a sign, we got t-shirts, we marched in the parade, and it was fun. And uh, we have uh, had a booth in, uh, in doing the cancer uh, program to raise money. And in various other ways, we have tried to be out there, visible in the community. Uh, there are things we haven't done yet that I'm hopeful we will do, uh, especially in terms of inviting people to participate in the spiritual life of the church. And then there is the branches and the leaves of the tree, and we call that branching out to serve. We learn the language of mission. Perhaps we know this language best of all because we know that uh, as a church we have through the years participation participated in mission projects to help those in need. And we have ongoing missions such as our food pantry participation. But we still have much more to do in this realm and so we continue learning the language of mission to those in need so we learn at least three languages now as you know we had a session retreat recently and one of the main topics that we began discussing was how we can incorporate these three languages and all that they represent into the session so that the session can begin leading in these areas and involve the congregation in them. And um, so it's going to require a little reorganizing and so we're working on that and we trust that the Spirit will lead us in that process and when the time comes, everybody's going to have the opportunity to get more connected with one or more features 
of these three areas of our ministry. And that's actually pretty exciting. I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to how this is going to shake out. Then another of the main things that we talked about was long-range planning. Now, when I said the session, Kathy was there also as a staff member, and also two additional folks in the church were there as members of our strategy and planning team. Now, one of the reasons, I want to share with you this, one of the reasons why we're trying to place these things in the session is not only so that we can actually focus on them every single month and keep them alive and involve more people in leadership and in planning and in doing, but we were in danger of having the strategy team be the only ones responsible for doing any planning and strategizing in these areas of our ministry. And so that sort of thing can lead to burnout, and we don't want that. And so it's time now for us to take this more centrally into the life of the church. We have called it New Beginnings, and we can continue calling it New Beginnings. But um, anyway... It gives us a way to articulate, to communicate what we're about in the ministry of the church, spiritually, outreach-wise, mission-wise. So, anyway, that frees then the mission and strategy team to do what they originally did, which was engage in some long-range planning. And so uh, we had a, a, an interesting conversation about um, long-range planning, and we began to ask, uh, where would you like to see the church in three years? And so people have been reflecting on that. So the, the strategy and planning team, they have responsibility for taking leadership in long-range planning, but it already involves a session, and not too distant in the future, everyone is going to have the opportunity to participate in the process. And why is that so important? It's important because a church needs to have goals and needs to have plans to reach those goals. Otherwise, we just sort of float along and we just sort of repeat last year and that's not very fun. But if you've got a, an exciting goal to work toward and figure out how to get there and work together to reach it, it gives life to the church. And, and when we're in that process, we start feeling the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us to engage in ministry associated with that goal. Um, I often think of a, of a person or any a church or anybody without a goal is is like a, a, a sailboat out in the lake and there's a nice breeze but they forget to put the sail up so they can't get anywhere and they just sort of are at the whim of the waves so we need to put our sail up always and I feel it's particularly important um, because I've for many years now I have observed that churches, especially in, in our era where so many are in decline, you know, um, so many in our era, um, when they get to a certain point, things get a little casual and, and churches forget to plan. They really do. And it took me a long time to realize how important it is for a church to be engaged in that always. Uh, we don't just stay stuck with one plan Everything keeps evolving. And our long-range planning this time is based in our three main areas of our emphases in ministry. But that will change too over time. In all of these ways, let us remember that the Holy Spirit, God's spiritual presence, will empower us to do what we should be doing, what we have been called 
to do as a church and as individuals, as believers. So put your trust in God's Spirit. Invite God into your life. Let God work with you and all of us in our work together. And finally now, in our lunch program today, it's about what? It's about communication in the church and in the larger community. And it's not just for fun. It's not just something to do. Instead, we believe that God's spiritual presence is empowering us and emboldening us to communicate in old and in new ways for the sake of the loving mission on which God is sending all of us. Amen.